Welcome back one last time to 6034 Fall 2020 review sessions. This will be the fourth and final installment of these review sessions and actually the final installment of my recordings for this course, at least this semester. Um, never say never, right? But uh, for the moment, this will be the last recording that I'll be making. And without further ado, let's get into what, of course, you came here for. Uh, the fourth installment, which will include I should mention beforehand support vector machines and ad adaptive boosting. So those will be the two, the last final topics of the series. As usual, feel free to take your time reading the uh, reading the prompt. I'll just go ahead and get started on this problem. Okay, so in very typical fashion for these kinds of support vector machines problems. We are asked to draw the support vector machine, draw the gutters, and just to highlight or circle somehow the support vectors. So that's actually precisely what I'm going to do. And I'm gonna go ahead and get a little bit ahead of myself because I have the graph right there, just to start writing down the equation of the decision boundary, which will just inevitably make things smoother in the next question. So right over here, I see that it's conveniently set up such that, whoops, such that I have a, a line of slope one right there. Never mind the the jagged straight line. And I'm going to switch color to draw in the gutters. So I have two support vectors on one side and then the, uh, the positive side, I have just one support vector. Let me go ahead and highlight them as the question asks. There we go. And that is my initial support vector machine setup. While I have the graph, as I mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and write down, or start writing down the equation. I see that I have, if I extend this axis a little bit, this would be negative one. So that's a y-intercept. And the slope is one as well, so this is one times x minus one, or in other terms, negative x plus y plus one is equal to zero. And this is actually gonna be convenient in a couple seconds. Here we go, because now we have to calculate the, the normal vector to the decision boundary, that's w, and the offset. So I'm going to write down the equation I just uh, wrote earlier, minus x plus y plus one is equal to zero, I think that was it, I already forgot, yep. It's equal to zero. And I'm just going to write it in a form that's a little bit easier to handle, at least for the purposes of this problem. It's going to be negative one, one, x and y, plus one, that's equal to zero, whoops. So if you, if you go back to the support vector machines recitation, you'll see that this is one of the basic equations and one of the steps actually in figuring out and solving these support vector machine problems. So here I have W prime, and I hope you remember why I call it W prime and not W vector just yet. So this is W vector prime, and this is B prime, because they're not technically officially the W vector and the B, the, the B offset, they are until I scale them and do all the appropriate checks on them first. So the first check that I'm going to do is a magnitude check. So <clears throat> if you remember the margin width equation, let me just draw a little space here. Margin width. I'm going to say that's M is equal to two over the magnitude of the w vector. So not w prime, just w. And I have to find out now what my margin width is. And I think a common mistake here would be, oh, the this is one and this is one, therefore my, therefore my margin width is equal to two. And that's, I want to caution you there because it's not exactly one and one because we're not, let me delete this extension here. 
because we're not dealing with this setup where there's one here and one here. We have to draw, in order to get the distance, we have to draw a perpendicular line from the decision boundary. So we measure the distance this way. And what that means is we have a right triangle with, let's see, with a, uh, I'm losing track of the geometry, one side one, one side one, and we want the hypotenuse of that triangle, which is square root of two. In the case of, so I'm so, in reality, this is half of the square root of two. This is half the square root of two, and then you just get the square root of two back. So the margin width is, I shouldn't have deleted that in hindsight. The margin width is actually the square root of two. So it's just uh, to caution you to be careful. It's not, it, things are not what they may seem, at least initially. <clears throat> so I have the square root of two is equal to two over the magnitude of W. Then I multiply W on the other side and divide by the square root of two. And this simplifies by, I multiply by the square root of two above and below the fraction. So I'm essentially multiplying by one. I'll just write it out explicitly just in case. Square root of 2 over the square root of 2. As you can see, that's just 1. And that should give me 2 on the bottom, which cancels out the 2 on the numerator. And I just end up with the square root of 2. So, the, so to make this brief, or to summarize, I want to use this space for the other calculations that I may need. The I'm going to delete all the calculations you've already seen. You can just rewind the video if you need to. The margin width equation gave me the following. The magnitude of w is equal to the square root of 2. And just to double check, I want to check what is the magnitude of w vector prime, which is equal to the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared. And that is actually the square root of 2. So it seems that w vector prime is at least in magnitude it's equal to our w vector that we're looking for but we still need to determine is w vector prime pointing in the direction that we want it to and we want it to point toward the positive points and yes you can eyeball this and say oh yeah this is fine but the stricter approach and the correct approach i should say is to apply the gutter constraint And as a reminder, in the in my set of notes for the support vector machines recitation, uh, I edited them such that the last slide of the recitation in the recitation notes is a summary of all the equations that have to do with support vector machines. So that they're all in one place and easy to see. So the gutter constraint, what it says is if I have Ignore, ignore the C at the moment. If I have, actually, uh, I'll just write out the gutter constraint and then W vector times some point X. And I should say this is a support vector plus the offset is, is this is going to be equal to exactly plus or minus one. And this, this is only when X is a support vector. So if X is a positive support vector, that, that number would be plus one, it would be equal to plus one. If X is a negative support vector, then it'll the equation will equal negative one. So now I'm going to say, because W prime is a, a is a, it just needs to be scaled to or rescaled to be W vector, then the constant factor C is what that scaling factor is. And B would also be needed need to, B would also need to be refactored by or rescaled by the same factor. So C times W vector prime times X vector plus B prime, that is equal to plus or minus one. Okay, and now I'm going to plug in negative one, one, and I'm going to use 
the following point. I'm going to use the positive support vector, which is 4, 4, point D, just because it's it'll be simpler, plus 1. And that's equal to plus, uh, positive 1. Actually, uh, I'll, I'll stop being lazy and actually write it explicitly. There we go. And now, let me just solve this. I multiply, so this dot product, it just this is just a very quick refresher in case you're unfamiliar with uh, linear algebra. This ends up being negative 4 plus 4 because I multiply this 4 by this negative 1, this 4 by this positive 1, and then I sum them. Let me undo that. I think that should be it. Okay. Yeah, so this is negative 4 plus 4 plus 1 is equal to 1. This obviously cancels out. And then c is equal to 1. And what this says is w prime times c is equal to w vector. b prime times c is equal to b. So I'm just going to write the final answer at the top, which is that w vector is negative 1, 1 and b is 1. Yep. And that is the final answer to this part of the question. This was actually relatively simple. Usually it is not the case that w vector is equal to the first w uh, w prime vector that you get the same with b. Usually you have to rescale somewhat some amount, but we just got lucky lucky with uh, this particular problem. And now the usual follow-up to this type of question is calculate the alpha values. And I am going to go ahead and switch to a view where I can also see the graph on the right. Okay, yeah. So I can see the graph on the right. And let me see whether, yeah, this would be better because I, there's a lot of numbers that are going to be floating around. And I think it'll be better. So this is the tear off sheet that was included in the quiz. I don't have a way of writing on it right now. So we'll have to do with it as it is. So the first, the first thing to know about the alpha values is because they are a measure of how much a particular point supports the decision boundary. If a point is not a support vector, it means it doesn't support the decision boundary and its alpha value is zero. So I can just go ahead and give a zero to the following points, which are not support vectors. And now I'll apply the first equation of the, these um, alpha values, which is zero is equal to the sum of alpha i times y i, which means it's the alpha value of a point multiplied by its classification, which is either plus one or negative one for all for these, this case. <clears throat> and when you sum all of those, you get zero. And I'm going to rewrite that because I only have three support vectors. That means alpha D, which is a positive point multiplied by positive one plus alpha D, sorry, alpha E, which is a negative point, so it's multiplied by negative one, plus alpha g, multiplied by negative one. That's so gonna be equal to zero. And in other words, zero is equal to alpha d minus alpha e minus alpha g. Oops. And that's one equation. The other equation that is very useful and this usually gives me in these problems in 6034 it gives you two equations it's that the w vector is equal to the sum of the point the x vector so that in this case is this is just the point xi alpha i yi so i'm going to go ahead and write negative one one is my w is equal to 0.44 times positive 1, because uh, that point was positive, times alpha d, 
minus from the y and this would be what is the other point the other point is 4 2 4 2 that is alpha e then minus What, uh, the other point, what is it? Seven, five. Alpha G. And so this is, this is already, I can turn this into two equations already. The top one and the bottom one, I'm going to rewrite them in, in that form. Just for simplicity's sake, four alpha D minus four alpha e minus 7 alpha g then 1 is equal to 4 alpha d minus 2 alpha e minus 5 alpha g and what I'm going to do now is I am going to multiply one of these equations by negative 1 and sum it to the top equation. So I'm going to multiply this bottom one by negative one and then add it to the top. So I multiply the bottom by negative one, which means I get a negative two down here. This is negative two, negative four times uh, plus four, which means this is zero times alpha d. This is a, a plus two, which means this is minus two alpha e plus five minus two alpha g and so I, I do some simplification here and I see that 1 is equal to alpha e plus alpha g and if I go to the top equation this one and I apply it down here this also means that 0 is equal to alpha d minus 1 because I have here um, whoops a negative alpha e alpha negative alpha g so this is negative 1 alpha d is equal to 1 and now I just need to find out what um, alpha e and alpha g are and I'm going to do something similar here on the side um, what I'm going to do is, let's see, I'm going to multiply the bottom equation instead of by negative 1 by negative 2. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. So this is going to be negative 2 times the bottom equation. I'm running out of space, so this is what uh, this will have to do. And I'm going to add to that negative 1, the top equation. In fact, I, I should write it out before things get confusing. So this is negative 2 times 1 is equal to 4 alpha d minus 2 alpha e minus 5 alpha g. And to this, just a reminder, I'm summing this other equation. This is equal, negative 1 equal to 4 alpha d minus 4 alpha e minus 7 alpha g. I understand that things are getting, are probably a little bit hard to read at this point for uh, just staring at, the, at, the, at these numbers. I won't, just a disclaimer, I won't be making these notes available. So if you need to follow along, note that one, this is just solving a simple, or maybe not simple, but this is just solving a system of equations and two, the recording is available. So you can just play it back if you have any doubts about what what is written where. So I'm summing these two and I have a negative three here at the bottom and I have then a negative 4 alpha d the alpha e's cancel 
and then I have a 10 alpha G minus 7 that means it's 3 alpha G if I'm doing this correctly and alpha D I know to be 1 so this is negative 3 minus 4 plus 3 alpha G this cancels out uh, the negative 4 I sum it on the other side so it cancels out I end up with 1 is equal to 3 alpha G alpha G is equal to 1 third and because I know that alpha D plus alpha I mean alpha E plus alpha G are equal to 1 I use this and determine that alpha E is equal to 2 thirds okay and so I go back up and I just report my numbers alpha D is equal to 1 and oops I did something wrong here yep and then alpha E is equal to 2 thirds alpha G is equal to 1 third and that is that is the extent of finding alpha values now we'll get a series of questions that have to do with moving points and calculating or maybe not calculating necessarily but thinking about how the alpha values would change so let me just redraw the decision boundary right here and the gutters Okay, so let's say alpha G was moved from 7, 5 to 6, 4, which would mean this type of change. So what I would notice here immediately is I'm going to use orange to highlight the change. So alpha D to alpha G were this distance, and that distance has now been closed, see, and not only has it been closed, then alpha G is now alpha G and alpha E are now symmetric around D. And if you remember from the support vector machines recitation, I did discuss a case in which the alpha the support vectors were symmetric around two support vectors on the opposite side were symmetric around a point in the middle on the on the other side of the decision boundary. And what happened in that case was that the support vectors on the that were symmetric on as in on either side of the other point had equal alpha values because they they the decision boundary or the weight is equally or symmetrically distributed on the two so if these two support vectors are going to have the same um the same alphas i'm just trying to delete the changes there. If they're going to have the same alphas, then alpha E has to decrease and alpha G has to increase. So they would be one half and one half because alpha D is still one. So that, that's the key. Alpha D was one. And if they're going to be, and if the sum of alpha E and alpha G is going to be equal to D, alpha D, so one, then they both have to be one half. So alpha E decreases. So if G is removed, then alpha E dot dot dot. Okay, so let's think about what happens if G is removed. I'm going to color over it in white just to make it a little bit more clear. So this one was actually a very tricky, uh, a very tricky one, and it was trickier than we had intended it to be when we wrote this quiz and I'll elaborate this question so let's suppose alpha G is removed then if you're in a rush and you're thinking intuitively about this you think okay alpha G is removed that means there's only one support vector on the negative side and there is a support vector on the positive side there's only two support vectors which means that alpha e increases because now instead of sharing the support of the decision boundary with alpha g it's by itself and that intuition is correct 
that is actually what we wanted that's the intuition that we would have wanted to develop and test in this uh, in this question however the fact of the matter what so if if you were if you answered with that intuition and you justified it with and you demonstrated your intuition by dem by thinking about how alpha e and alpha g are supporting the decision boundary then then perfect you you know this uh, this is okay however the correct answer would uh, was the following so i've why um i whited out alpha g and <clears throat> I, I whited out alpha g sorry and i'm just going to delete the decision boundary because this is the new decision boundary. More or less. So the decision boundary actually changes. And that is, that is the, <clears throat> That, that was the tricky part of this question. The decision boundary changes, and not only does it change, these margins are actually larger than before. Because before we had the square root of 2, we basically had one of these squares divided in half. And so that was basically the distance. If you had two points on either side of the decision boundary, that would be the distance so on the gutters on each side of the decision boundary that would have been the distance between the two points but that's no longer the case because now there's let's say the point is here there is that distance plus a little bit more so the ma the margins this this drawing the lines and such are not exactly accurate but what i'm saying is true that the margins are now larger and because they are larger, alpha e de decreases in reality. So what really happens mathematically is that, let's see, I, I wrote it down here to make sure I, I, wouldn't, <clears throat> I wouldn't mix up the numbers. The alpha value of, alpha, of e was actually 2 thirds but it goes down to 5 eighths with the new margin. So it mathematically it decreases because the margin width decreases. However, <clears throat> if you, as I said before, and this, uh, this uh, um, is, is important, what we wanted to test was that you understood that if if e was the only decision bound, uh, the only support vector in the support vector supporting the boundary, and if you mentioned that is it, that the that the decision boundary would change, so there was re you would recognize that this, the decision boundary would change because a support vector was removed, and that e would be the support vector, and then c and d would be the other support vectors then you have you have demonstrated that you have this intuition and that you know under this newly created decision boundary you think that alpha e would increase because it's alone you just maybe didn't have the time to mathematically go through this and this is actually a tough problem to solve so while i'm at it i'll say if you want to recalculate the w and the offsets and the alpha values in this scenario in this setup then it's hard, but if you're able to do it, you you should be more than ready for, uh, or you should have a very good understanding of support vector machines. Okay. So that's enough of that question. I, I definitely wanted to pay a little bit more attention to this question than, than the others, just because of that little detail. So just to recap, if you, if you recognized that alpha E or if, if you incorrectly said alpha e increased, but you incorrectly said it because the decision boundary changed first, first and foremost, 
and in the new configuration C, D, and E are the support vectors and because E is a support vector on its own the margin width or the because E is a support vector on its own then the alpha value would increase then power to you that is that is exactly what we wanted to hear from from you okay so if each negative point is translated one unit to the right and one unit down and this actually plays into what i was just discussing so one unit down and one unit to the right so this would be e this would be g now and i let me just delete these then the new decision boundary would be uh, not that the decision boundary would be somewhere more in the middle so the margin width would increase and because the margin width increases remember that margin width m is equal to 2 over w and w is equal to the sum of x alpha and y so whenever if this if the margin increases w must decrease and if w decreases so must the alpha values so the when the margins increase because of this move then alpha e decreases okay and this was another tricky one if a positive point is added at 6 6 So a positive point is added at 6, 6. Where is that? That's right here. Which means... I can't help but butcher my decision boundaries. Somewhat. Which means it falls on the gutter. And... This, this forms a degenerate case, as I, I know I, I mentioned and discussed extensively in my support vector machines recitation. And the, what I recommended in these situations was pick a set of three valid support vectors and do whatever conclusion you need to do based on that. And that, that's, where the, that's where the test in this question is is there are two valid sets of support vectors h and g because they represent this case of whoops they represent the following case right where two points were directly facing each other those are two pos possible support vectors and the other two possible ones were to use a different color i'll use green g d and e so if I were to pick the green support vectors, then alpha E stays the same. If I were to pick the black support vectors, then E would decrease because it would become zero. And because we are asked to circle, if uh, multiple options are possible to circle all the possible options, then that was the recognition that needed to happen. So it decreases if the support vectors are h and g but it remains unchanged if the support vectors are e d and g i believe they are e d and g let me double check e d and g yes okay. and now just uh, now we're going to go to yet another question on support vector on um, not support vectors but on alpha values and how they change according to the decision uh, how do they change according to a support vector's relationship to the decision boundary so feel free to read this question at your own leisure i'll just proceed and this is just the setup of how this uh how we'll be interacting with this question and answering it so this point is moved in some direction, usually in the right direction. And then we have to 
reply with a plot that qualitatively describes how the alpha value will change. So the first one, this point is moved in this direction. And the first thing that I would say is at this point, we're in the following scenario where there's only two support vectors because the two points are directly facing each other, which means this point will be completely supporting the decision boundary on its own. So alpha is going to increase. And then as it moves away, the, let's say, whoops, let's say it's here and the other negative point is here, the, the decision boundary is going to start moving and the margin is going to start increasing. So the margin is going to increase and as the margin increases, alpha value goes down. But then let's say this is the support vector. What happens when we get to this point? Then it is no longer a support vector. So its alpha value goes down to zero. And this is actually the answer to that question. Let me be a little bit more civilized in how I answer it so that you can see the actual graph. These are the other options in case you want to take a look at what they might represent. So here we have some decision boundary here. You can consider it why the decision boundary doesn't really matter. We just know that these two points that are directly facing each other are the support vectors of the decision boundary and we're moving away from the decision boundary, which means that we're increasing the margin and we're progressively decreasing w, thereby decreasing the alpha values. So this will be the answer to that question. And now finally, we have a case that is actually similar to the first one of these, where we're moving away from the decision boundary and eventually there's a trade-off point where the point stops being the stops being the support vector in exchange for another point that will hold the gutter in place basically. And that would be best represented by this point. Sorry, by this graph. Where we're moving away, 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 away from the decision boundary. And then suddenly the other negative point is the, decision, the support vector. So this point no longer supports the decision boundary. Its alpha value is zero. And now onto the last section of these um, of these uh, questions of support vector machines of the support vector machine section of this quiz, and it's the uh, kernels. So this is uh, going toward the very last, or not not the last slide anymore, but the last section that I discussed in my support vector machines recitation video. And it's asking generally which kernels can separate these data sets and each question has its own data set. And it's very easy to see in this case, if I were to draw a line, straight line, I can easily separate that data. So it's linear. And yes, I could start drawing parabolas and, and cubes and such in order to start, um, in order to decide how which kernels can cl classify which however if a linear kernel can do it which is a polynomial kernel with a exponent of one that means a quadratic can do it because a quadratic is just as powerful a quadratic can do it everything that a linear kernel can do and more and the cubic can do everything a quadratic can do and more so if a linear kernel can do it i automatically know a quadratic kernel can also um, do it, a polynomial kernel can do it, and a radial basis function can do it. So I just need to find basically the minimum that I need to separate it and then everything else follows. Okay, and let's see. And now I have this equation, and or not this equation, this data set, 
and I could just, I can't separate it with a line anymore, but I could draw a parabola here. And if a parabola, which is a quadratic kernel, or a, par a parabola is draw can be drawn by a quadratic kernel. So a quadratic kernel is capable of separating this, which means also a polynomial and the radial basis function kernel. Lastly, this one. And this one, it's, it's very hand wavy because a parabola obviously can't separate this, but a high enough degree polynomial can. And the reason is if you, when, once you get to exponents that are extremely high, you, uh, you can get these very contoured and curvy shapes in the, in the decision boundaries because of the high power of the exponent and how many terms it has. So it basically can, as, as the exponent tends to infinity, the more it, the more the, the kernel and the decision boundary can mold itself around the data. It's not quite as powerful as the radial basis function, but it can, for example, do this or it can do something like this. So a, a very high degree polynomial kernel can separate this data and the radial uh, basis function can as well. Just because if a polynomial can do it, so can a radial basis function. And now this one. And this one, one would argue, so here we have two overlapping points and it's deceptively easy because I could do this and argue, oh, you know, a line separates it except for that one point. And, but because this question is asking, what, how can you perfectly, which kernels can perfectly classify all the data? Not even a radial basis function can do it because a radial basis function would draw a circle here and it would be unable to separate two exactly overlapping points. Yes, it's noise, but it's a good concept to have that even overlapping points are, you know, an overlapping point is too much for a radial basis function. So this was the key in this particular problem. And with that, that is actually the end of these support vector machines problems. In the next section, I'll be talking about adaptive boosting and working through that problem as well. Welcome back to the second section of the fall 2020 quiz four. Now we're going into adaptive boosting. You have, you know, go, take your time reading through this problem. I'll, as soon as the, the questions start, I'll project this table on the left hand side of the screen so that we have a, so that both I and you have a view of the points and the classifiers that we're dealing with. And this is, I'll just leave this here so that you can see it. I won't be able to project this in particular. So this, uh, this will have to, you'll have to keep it in mind or have it written down somewhere. I can only project the top table. Okay. And once you've, so this is the last bit of um, information to digest before this problem, I'm going to go ahead and set up this, uh, whoops, I still have the SVM problem there. <clears throat> so now, now that's set up, let me start looking through the points that are misclassified here. So I have, I'm, ca I'm making sure to be able to catch up to my notes because I definitely don't want to get lost in, in all the reading in this case. So H a, which, which says that it rained will misclassify it, that if, if it rained on that day, then the game was won. It misclassifies points two, oops, points two in which 
it did not rain, but the game was won. Points three, same thing. Point four, in which it did rain, but the game was lost. And point five. And then HB, where the opposite condition is true, that's, e that's an easy one because it's exactly the opposite of the top, the top classifier. And the same for the bottom one, where if a coin toss was won, then the game was also won. That one only misclassifies point four. A coin toss was won, but the game was lost. So point four, then classifier D will misclassify every other point. One, two, three, five, and six. And then the last three, if the jerseys were green, the game was one, which means one is correct, two is incorrect, and six is incorrect. Or actually, uh, two is in one is correct. Yes, two is incorrect, and six was incorrect as well. Two and six. Then if the jerseys were blue, the game was one. One is incorrect. Three is incorrect and five is incorrect. One, three, five. Then for purple, one is incorrect, two is incorrect, three is incorrect, and four is incorrect. One, two, three, four. That's an unlucky one. Okay, so we have all the classifier mistakes note them note them down somewhere or you'll ha or mark this timestamp in the video because I'll be I, I won't be I'll have to I would have to flip back and forth between pages a lot more than I already do in order to keep track of everything so I've written down a, uh, some information on my side so that I don't have to go back and forth as much for the next section which is uh, which is obviously um, do this add a boost problem and add a boost I want to highlight that it is error rate furthest from one half and that ties are break broken according to alphabetical order so those are important things to keep in mind so the error rate of HA which misclassifies four points is four six and then B which is the opposite is two six then HC, the coin toss, was, was extremely good for some reason. So that's 1, 6. Then 5, 6, because the, the opposite, it, HD was the opposite of HC. And then we get into the colored shirts. The green had two mistakes. The blue had three out of six. And the purple had four out of six incorrect. And now we have to choose a classifier with the error furthest from one half. There are two of them, one sixth and five sixths. But because we're going in alphabetical order, it would be one sixth. So I have that HC is the best classifier and the error rate is one sixth. Now the alpha value, the voting power, I'll write it down the equation this way. Uh, briefly, it's one half natural log of one minus error rate over error rate. I'll have to delete this once I start writing down the the voting powers and whatnot, or the the final classifier. So this ends up being one half natural log of five. Once you do all the arithmetic. And now what's left is to calculate the new weights. And there is a formula for calculating the weights and it's in the recitation video. I recommend you go and check it out if you don't know the formula. There's also a very standard trick to doing, or not very standard, but there's an easy trick to doing it. The Recall that the error rate of the best classifier in round x minus one is going to be one half in round X. So the best classifier from the previous round is going to have an error rate 
of one half in the next round, which means the misclassified point is going to be uh, is going to have or the misclassified points, um, better said, are going to have a, a a weight of that sums up to one half. Let's see. So in, in this case, for example, the <clears throat> HC misclassified point four, which means this point is going to have a weight of one half. And in round two, when C inevitably misclassifies point four again, then C HC is going to have an error rate of one half. And what that also means is all the other points have an error rate that also sums up to one half. So I have to scale the five points that are remaining in such a way that they sum up to one half. So one over 10, 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 one over 10. If you're curious about why, feel free to refer to the Adabus facts section of the recitation, which will have more information on it. Let me grab some water. <clears throat> Okay, so now I have to calculate the error rates once again. So this is 8 out of 10 because it makes classified 0.4 in addition to three more points. And then the opposite of that in the bottom classifier is 2 out of 10 or 1 fifth. Then I have 1 half in HFC which also means HD is going to be one half. And <clears throat> uh, let's see, HE is going to misclassify two of the points that have weight one over 10, which means, whoops, this is going to be two over 10. Then HF is going to classify three points that have weight one over 10 and then poor old uh, classifier HG has an error rate of H over 10 as well. And if we're picking the classifier with the error rate furthest from one half and going by alphabetical order, it's going to be HA. So HA is, go whoops, HA is going to have a an error rate of four fifths. And if I apply the formula here at the bottom, it's going to be one half natural log of doing some quick arithmetic here. It's going to be one fourth, but that is equal to negative. I'm going to rewrite this as negative one half natural log of four, just so that we have nicer numbers. Okay, and now I have to reweight everything. So it's going to be relatively easy to reweight the points that HA, no, so it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's give me uh, a second to gather what is going where. Okay, so HA, if I'm not mistaken, misclassifies points two, three, four, and five, but I want to verify that quickly. Yes, two, three, four, and five. And I'm going to do some quick math here. So we know that the point, the misclass, so let me start off again. So I know HA in the next round is going to have an error rate of one half. And this, this classifier is also going to have an error rate of one half because it's the opposite of HA. And now what is going to happen is I need to take points two, 
3, 4, and 5, and they all have to sum up to 1 half. And these two also have to sum up to 1 half, and that's actually going to be easy. Because they can, they're, they're only two points, and they have the same, they have the same weight. So I can just distribute the sim evenly, 1 over 4, 1 over 4. And if I need to change the fractions to make them more directly comparable, then I'll do so quickly now, after doing this calculation. So let's see, I have the, the trick here is the points, the misclassified points on one round are going to sum up to one half on the next round in terms of weight, but they are going to keep the same proportions with each other, the same uh, fractional differences between each other. And what I mean by that is they're going to be scaled by the same factor. So I'm going to have one half plus one over 10 plus one over 10 plus one over 10, and that's going to be equal to one half, right? So what happens now is, let me do some quick arithmetic here. That's 3 tenths plus 5 tenths. That's going to be 8 over 10. If I'm doing this correctly, and that's going to be equal to 1 half, which means x is going to be equal to 5 over, five over 8. And now what I have to do is multiply 5 over 8 by all these points, each of these points. So 5 over 8 times 1 over 10 is going to be 1 over 16. 1 over 16, and then 5 over 8 times 5 over 10 is going to be 5 over 16, and then 1 over 16. And then a quick check to make sure that they sum up to one half. One over 16 plus one over 16 plus five is seven plus another one is eight over 16, that's one half, yes. And then for easy comparison, I'm gonna make the top and bottom points out of 16 as well. So it's gonna be four over, four over 16 and the bottom one is also gonna be four over 16. And now I can proceed to calculate the error rates. So I have one half, one half, HC again is going to be five over 16. Then the error rate of HD, which is the opposite, is going to be one minus five over 16. So it's 11 over 16. And then the green, the green classifier as in when the shirts are green, that's going to be five over 16 then hf the blue classifier 6 over 16 then the purple shirts one is going to be 11 over 16. which means the next point or the next best classifier to be chosen is going to be hc 5 over 16. five over 16 and the voting power is going to be one half natural log of that's an ugly function to solve it's going to be uh 11 over 15 uh, 11 over 5. now that i've done what i would with the or what i was planning on doing with the alpha values then the ensemble classifier h of x then is going to be equal to the sign so the sign here is very important uh, because it's where because it's a binary classifier we're dealing with plus one or minus one and so the 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 you can think of the weak classifiers of voting to make a particular point either more negative or more positive so that the the final classifier says, okay, this is a plus one point or this is a negative one point. 
this is one half natural log of five h uh, hc of x minus negative voting power one half natural log of four h a then plus one half natural log of 11 over 15. Oh, uh, whoops. I ran out of space and I panicked. 11 over 15 times HC. There. HC of X and HA of X. I just ran. That was a, a race for space situation. And you'll be disappointed to know that I was given all of the space to conduct all of those calculations, but I thought having all the information on the screen would have been a better choice. Okay. And now we're asked, which classifiers will never be selected for this ensemble classifier? And this one is actually an easy one because B and, B and D, and I'll say why. And the reason is the error rate of how do I express error rate? So error rate A of classifier A is going to be equal to one minus the error rate of classifier B. And the same is true for the other, the other pair. The error rate of C is equal to one minus the error rate of D. And because we were choosing the, it's a combination of two things. We were choosing the classifier with an error rate furthest from one half these two, error rate A and B, and error rate C and B, they, those two pairs will always be equally distant from one half. But because we were breaking ties alphabetically, A was always going to be preferred over B, and H of C is always going to be preferred over D. And they're always going to be, because they're, they're mirror, not mirror images, but because it's one minus, it's a situation where they're both equally distant, and then A just has the upper hand because it comes first alphabetically. So H A and H C were always going to be picked over B and D. Okay. So now we have the following, uh, we have the data set reproduced and we're asked to classify each of these training points. And what I want to bring to your attention is I'm going to go back briefly to the previous classifier. Notice that we have H of C here and H of C here again. So H of C effectively is voting twice with positive voting power, and it's always going to overpower H of A, which is only voting once, which means the, uh, the ensemble classifier is essentially just going to repeat whatever classification H of C gives. And I feel a sneeze coming, so if I, if I pause, you know why, no false alarm. <clears throat> okay, so let's see, where was I? That, that, that made me lose my train of thought. Oh, we're classifying according to our ensemble classifier and we have thankfully the data reproduced here. So we have game two, which is a game where the coin toss was won and the game outcome won and the game was won, which means game two is correctly classified. Remember, we're, we're basically obeying this column because our ensemble classifier has H of C voting twice and H of A only opposing, only one opposing classifier, which is H of A. So game four, the coin toss was won and the game outcome was lost lost so this is misclassified and then we have game six in which the coin toss was lost and the game was also lost so this is correctly classified so it's not too too bad okay. so now this is the last section of out of boost and we are told that we can only use classifiers of this form. So X is greater than or equal to something, and that means that is a positive classification. 
and we're asked to choose a classifier with the minimum error rate if we're only considering classifiers where x is greater than or equal to something. And the classifier with the minimum error rate in that case is x is greater than or equal to 2, where if it's greater than or equal to 2, we get a positive classification. If it's less than or equal to 2, we get a negative classification. And it's the best, the best classifier because we only misclassify one point versus having one here where we would classify four points incorrectly, or one here where we would misclassify two points incorrectly. So that's the best classifier we could have gotten. And now we perform one round of add a boost and we're asked to circle after that one round, which point is going to have the increased weights. And that is going to be this point because it was the only point that was misclassified by, whoops, that is a terrible line there, by this classifier. And because it's the only point that was misclassified, then it's the only one with an increased weight. And now we're talking about whether, let's see, in th exactly three rounds of out of, boost, out of boost or adaptive boosting, whether the ensemble classifier would be able to perfectly classify the entire set of points. And the answer is no. And this answer actually relies on the adaptive boosting facts at the end of my out of boost recitation. In particular, <clears throat> there was one discussion in which I was talking about the classic adaptive boosting versus the other adaptive boosting. And by classic versus the other one, I meant that classic is one where the minimum error rate is the best classifier. The classifier with the, the least amount of errors or the fewest errors is the best classifier instead of the furthest from one half. And that is actually the setup that we have here. If you are, if you, if we think back, let's see. Yep, that's the detail I forgot to highlight. Minimum error rate. So we have minimum error rate, and the the Adabus fact that is crucial in in determining what will happen is the following: If the set of errors in classifier H let's say H1 is strictly a superset of the set of errors committed by H2. So all of the errors that H2 commits are in H1 and then a couple more. And if, so if this and that, uh, if this is the setup where H1 is a superset, the errors of H1 is a superset of H2, and we're choosing minimum error rate is best, then add a boost will never choose H1. And that is actually exactly what's happening here because we have we have um, x is greater than or equal to 2 here and x is greater than or equal to 0 and those two so the mistakes that x is greater than or equal to 0 commits I'm going to write it in a different color so that it'll mix them, mix them up I'm just going to circle the mistakes that it makes. So x, x is greater than or equal to 0 is not a subset or a superset of x is greater than or equal to 2 and vice versa. If x is greater than or equal to 2 is neither a subset or a superset of x is greater than or equal to 0. But when we consider any other classifier that we make, make add this one, so the errors that x is greater than or equal to 3 commits are a superset of x is greater than or equal to 2. 
So x is greater than or equal to 3 will never be picked. And likewise, the errors that, let's see, the errors that x is greater than or equal to 1 commits are a superset of the errors that x is greater than or equal to 0 commits. I'm staring at the points to make sure that I'm that what I'm saying is correct. Yes, x is greater than or equal to one is a superset. The mistakes that it makes are a superset of x is greater than or equal to zero. So we have. So in reality, those two, the classifier here, and here will never be picked, and so what's going to happen is Adaboost is going to pick x is greater than or equal to two for round one x is greater than or equal to 0 for round 2 and then for round 3 x is greater than or equal to 2 again which means in exactly 3 rounds which is what the question is asking this problem will not have been solved and i would i would venture to say this isn't going to be solved because of the because of the way this question is set up and one, one more thing that I would like to add is <clears throat> if you, uh, so a, a common mistake in this setup was assuming, so let me, I'm going to delete everything and then restart this question under a different assumption. The assumption that I'm going to change is the classifiers that I have available. So it was, a, it was a very common mistake for students to choose this type of classifier. In which, so this is a classifier where x is less than or equal to t. And I'm going to, even though this is not the question anymore, I want to discuss this um, solution. So what it means is, so this is the misclassified point, but what when I see this, I'm thinking, well, this no longer applies, which means the following are the classifiers that I have my, at my disposal. I have x is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 0, greater than or equal to 1, 1, 2, 2, so on and so forth. So, so there's a lot more flexibi flexibility in this Adaboost setup, which means if this is the best classifier that I choose, this is the point with the increased weight. And in this setup, Adaboost can in fact solve this in exactly three rounds. And I encourage you to do this exercise on your own and see that it is solved in exactly three rounds. And in particular, this is what is going to happen, or what you'll see if you, if you try this on your own. Round one is going to choose x is greater than or equal to two, just as in, um, just as in the previous question. Round two is x is less than or equal to one, and then round three x is greater than or equal to zero. That's an exercise I encourage you to try on your own. And let me, um, so the, the assumption that I made in order to get that solution is I did the following. So this, um, I broke ties alphabetically or order from top to bottom. And this is the order in which I staged the classifiers. So if, so if x is greater than or equal to 2 had the same minimum error rate as, for example, x less than or equal to 1, which is the case, I would have chosen x greater than or equal to 2 just because it came first in the order. And that's how I end up with round 1 choosing x greater than or equal to 2, round 2 choosing x le less than or equal to 1, and then round 3 
choosing x greater than or equal to two uh, to zero sorry i if you ha heard the rustling of paper it's because i i double checked how i actually solved uh, this problem or in which order I had the classifiers so, such that you would be able to have exactly the same setup and the same information that I did when I solved it. Now this is, so after talking about that, this is the last question of Adaboost, which is what needs to be true in order for Adaboost to be able to perfectly classify any training, any set of training points. And Remember that Adaboost is a linear combination of is a linear combination of a bunch of classifiers. So the assumption that is made, or the condition that needs to be true, is in in an Adaboost setup if we want the ensemble classifier to be able to, sorry, that's embarrassing, to be able to perfectly classify all the, all the points is <clears throat> that the, the data needs to be linearly separable by some linear combination of the weak classifiers. Uh, sorry, I butchered that last word, but you know that it says classifiers. And that was actually one argument um, to be made in this setup. So I'm going back, I'm reverting to the setup in which only x greater than or equal to t classifiers were allowed. So only this type of classifier. So notice that there is no linear combination of the classifiers in this arrangement. Well, because of the, because of the way it was set up, the only two classifiers were these two or sorry were these two and there is no linear combination that of those two that would have been able to solve to separate this data the way it is set up that's why we would have needed this type of classifier and then we would have needed a third classifier in order to agree with this one on the positive side and agree with this one on the negative side on the other positive side and then these two classifiers would have would have agreed on the negative side for for this problem in order to be for this problem to be solvable yep. so that's actually the last question of this um, section which also means That is, this is the last question of the review session and therefore of the of the series of videos and I just want to say that it's been very fun and very enriching to record the, these videos I hope they have been as useful to you as they have been to me and as a final as a final note in 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 saying goodbye in, in this series of videos is I want to give you and I'm writing it down the last and most powerful message that we typically teach in 6034 and this has been taught ever since Professor Winston taught this course And it is the following. You can do it, only you can do it, and you can't do it alone. And perhaps the greatest and the most important exercise that I can leave for you to try at home is to think about this deeply and perhaps take it to heart 
perhaps not, but I, I fulfilled my duty in communicating this important message and this important 6034 message to you before the, uh, concluding the series of videos. And with that, I, I sign off and I'll see you when, when I see you.